All right, thanks for watching. And today I want to show you why Gaussian elimination works. So it's a technique that you use probably over 100 times in linear algebra, but you're probably like, why does it always work? Why do I always get the correct answer? Well, today I will explain you why. And I've been looking for proof of this online or in the textbooks, I couldn't find one. And so I made a proof up on my own, but there's no guarantee it's correct. I hope it's correct, but we'll see. So what is Gaussian elimination? Using row, row operations, like interchanging two rows, or multiplying a row by a number, or adding a multiple of one row to the other, we can transform any matrix into what's called row echelon form which is just kind of like, like a triangular form, which just says, first of all, the rows of zeros have to be at the bottom, and then the first non-zero rows, I'm sorry, the first non-zero entries in each row, we call them pivots, and everything below and to the left of a pivot has to be zero. So this is called a row echelon form, and what I will show today is using those row operations we can turn any matrix into a row echelon form. So theorem, if A is n by n, then A can be turned into row echelon form. And at the end, I'll also explain reduce row echelon form, how that works. Uh, so why? Well, you see, Gaussian elimination is kind of like a step-by-step -step process. And usually for those step-by-step -step processes, it's good to use induction. And here we will use induction on M, the rows, because it's called row reduction. So induction on M. And you might say, oh, if M is zero, it's the empty matrix, we're done, which is correct. But just for the sake of clarity, let's assume M is one. Well, then A has only one row. But a matrix in one row, it has a triangular form because either it's zero, and that's by definition in row echelon form, or uh, there's a non-zero entry somewhere. So the first non-zero entry and everything to the left of this first non-zero entry is actually zero. So, and there might be even no zeros, which is also okay. So hopefully we agree that um, a matrix with just one row is in row echelon form. And now let's do the induction step. So suppose it is true for, um, so induction step. So suppose true for n by n matrices And show it's true for n plus 1 times n matrices. So suppose A is a matrix with n plus 1 rows and n columns. First of all, if there's any row of zeros, let's say 0, well, then just interchange the rows and put those row, that row of zeros at the bottom. So by interchanging, we can make sure that all the zeros are at the bottom. Okay, and that's first of all. And then, so what you have to do is the following. So we're guaranteed that the row of zeros at, at the bottom now, look at the first column, okay, here. And suppose worst case scenario, everything is zero. Not a problem. Move on to the second column. If everything else is zero, it's okay. Move on until you find the first entry, which is non-zero, okay? And 
without loss of generality. So everything here works with, you know, zero columns, but assume that this non-zero entry now is in the first column, else just repeat the proof with everything included. So assume that we have a non-zero entry here and possibly other entries. And remember everything else at the, at the bottom is zero. Then make sure this, or maybe let me write it this way. So we have the first non-zero entry and a bunch of other non-zero entries. Doesn't matter, okay? Now, make sure using interchanging the two rows that this non-zero entry is at the top. Then we get something that's non-zero and then maybe some junk. And then, because this is non-zero, we can divide by divided by itself. So if you have something of the form two, divide it by two and make this one. So now, after dividing, we can assume this is one. And assume you have other terms, possibly zero. That's completely fine. So a uh, two one, a three one, and then a m plus one, one. So suppose for, for sake of simplicity, we have one, two, three, four. Then take this row and subtract, I'm sorry, take this row and subtract a two one times the first row. So here, for example, you would subtract uh, minus two times the first row. Here, you would subtract minus three from the first row and then minus four. And so do this, and you get times minus a21 times minus a31 da, 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 times minus a m plus 1, 1. And by the way, if all of them were 0, it's completely fine, because um, it just means you do nothing. And in fact, if the first column is like 1, 0, 0, 0, essentially you're done, and you move on to the next one. So after this process, you actually get that the first column is one and bunch of zeros, and then bunch of zeros at the bottom if you want. And then basically what I'm saying is the first column is done, first row is done. We are in row echelon form for this first row. And then we have another matrix with rows two, three, dot, 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 n plus one. And essentially what you do, you do induction on this second matrix here. So call this matrix B. The matrix has size precisely uh, M, M times M. So M plus 1 minus 2, which is M minus 1, plus 1, which is M. So B is M by M. B again, which it might be some junk, is M by M. So by induction and hypothesis, we can actually row reduce B to get, to become tri in triangular form. And then what does that tell us about A? So here's the issue, by the way, so here's also an issue because it's possible, so induction hypothesis says that if you row reduce this matrix, it becomes triangular, but it's possible that we take this column of zeros that we have here and turn them into non-zero columns. But that's actually not possible. Just think of it by the nature of uh, row reduction. Because if you interchange two rows, you just interchange those two zeros, so it'll stay zero. If you multiply a row by a non-zero number, this zero will still stay zero, etc., etc. And if you add, let's say, three times this row to this row, this zero will also stay zero. So B, what it looks like, actually, looks like a bunch of zeros. And then something upper triangular, and again, by assumption, we assume all the zero rows are at the bottom. And then let's look at A. So what does A look like? We said A, you row reduce it to something like one and then bunch something, and then B. 
And also here's the thing, so B is a smaller matrix, but you can show that the same process that rho reduces B to this matrix, rho reduces this whole matrix to the, this matrix. So essentially what A looks like is just one, and then B, which is a bunch of zeros, and then something triangular, and then everything zero is at the bottom. And then the question is, why is this in row echelon form? So first of all, are all the zero rows at the bottom? Yes, precisely, because of this thing. So we assume we made sure that all the zero rows at, are at the bottom, and row reduction doesn't change those zero rows at all. So those zero rows stay the same, and any zero rows or B are also at the bottom. That's fine too, by induction assumption. And then, is everything to the left or below the pivot zero? Well, yeah. Here, everything at the bottom of this pivot is zero. And there's nothing here to the left, so it's fine too. And then everything to the left and the bottom of B is also zero, because B is in row echelon form. So this is in row echelon form, and we're kind of done. Just one more objection, you might be like, oh, but not every matrix has this form in row echelon form. What about like 0, 0, 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 4, 5, 0, 0, 6? Well, it actually includes this case because remember at the beginning, I was like, oh, just ignore the zero columns. You can just literally redo this proof with the zero columns. So what you would you do with this matrix? You would take, ignore the zero column and then do the proof with this matrix. So indeed, this works. And therefore, we're done with our induction. And we've just shown that any matrix can be turned into a row echelon form. So now you can just do Gauss with in peace. So this is row echelon form, and you might ask, what about reduced row echelon form? For example, this is in row echelon form, but not reduced. So reduced just means, first of all, the pivots are one. Let's say here are one. And it's not hard to do, because by definition, the pivots here are non-zero. So if you want the pivots to be one, just divide by their values. Like here you would divide by four, here you would divide by six. So we get a bunch of ones. And then the next requirement is simply that everything in a pivot column, like here the second, third, and fourth column, has to be zero in, except for the pivots. But that's also not too bad because I guess technically you can use kind of an induction on the pivot columns or just do it directly. First of all, this last column, you can just take every other entry. And I guess let's say here, let's say again it's m by n now, and then this is a, uh, what's called, um, sorry, a1n, a2n, dot, dot, dot. Then you would take this entry and subtract a2n from this row and subtract a1n from this row. So for example here, you would subtract 5, and you would subtract 3, and then you get something like 0, 1, 2, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. So at least the last column, you can turn it into a bunch of zeros, and then essentially repeat everything for all the other columns. Now, the only objection you might possibly have is, well, if you do row reduction, wouldn't that change this column? Well, not really, because remember, when you do row reduction here, it would be on top. You would take this row and then multiply, add multiples of this to the rows above. So first of all, the zeros at the bottom won't be affected. And also notice, here you have a bunch of zeros. So if you add a multiple of this row to any row above, it would be zero times something plus zero. So everything would still be zero. So in this example, what you would you do? You would 
subtract two times the second row from the first row, and you will get, so zero, one, this becomes zero, and those zeros, they rest in peace. They're completely unaffected by this row operation. And then you are left with exactly what you want, something that is in reduced row echelon form. And therefore, any matrix, you can even further reduce it into reduced row echelon form. And what's nice about this latter uh, description is that it's unique. And there's a wonderful video I made I showed that the row, reduced row echelon form is unique. So now you can reduce row echelon reduce in peace. All right, I hope you like this little video and I hope it's very soothing now. Um, if you want to see more math, please make sure to subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much.